Raman spectroscopy, similar to its IR counterpart, is a spectroscopic technique used to analyze the vibrations within a system. It's also better than IR, since you can use it for quantitative analysis. Ah, yes. Its main light source is usually a laser capable of producing a target wavelength from the visible to near infrared or ultraviolet region. The underlying principle of Raman spectroscopy, Raman scattering, was first conceived by Adolf Smickel in 1923. <laughs> There's no relation to the other guy, despite appearances. However, it was until five years later, in 1928, that the Raman effect was observed experimentally for the first time by physicist Sir C. V. Raman, who was later named after, and Kiyosh Krishnan, using sunlight as a main light source. Both Raman and IR spectroscopy involve vibrational energies. The main difference is that while IR active transitions occur for the interaction of light and a dipole moment of a vibrating molecule, Raman active transitions arise from an oscillating induced dipole created by the interaction of light and the polarizability ellipsoid or electron clouds of a vibrating molecule. When a high-powered light source, typically a laser, is shined onto a molecule, the energy of incoming photons is absorbed and induces a transition between different vibrational, rotational, or electronic energy levels. The vibrational component is what's usually measured for Raman spectroscopy. In effect, the electric field from an incident photon interacts with the electron cloud of a vibrating molecule and results in the deformation of shape of the electron cloud itself. This change in polarizability causes the emitted photons to be scattered at various energies and in wavelengths. The emitted photons can either be elastically or inelastically scattered, depending on the energy of the incident and emitted photons. Most of the emitted photons are elastically scattered and possess the same energy and wavelength as the incident photon. This is called Rayleigh scattering. On the other hand, a small percentage of emitted photons on the order of 1 in 10 million, are inelastically scattered. These photons either have lower or higher energy than the incident photon, and are known as Stokes-Raman and anti-Stokes-Raman scattering, respectively. Overall, the process of inelastic photon scattering is what's known as the Raman effect, and is usually what is observed using Raman spectroscopy. Since Raman spectroscopy is used to analyze changes in vibrational energy, it uses principles from the harmonic oscillator and anharmonic oscillator models of quantum mechanics, which describe molecular vibrations. Thus, for vibrational Raman spectroscopy, the principal quantum number, labeled as V, has a selection rule where delta V is plus or minus 1 for the harmonic oscillator, and delta V is plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, etc. for the anharmonic oscillator, which gets quite complicated. Interestingly enough, we can apply the concepts learned in quantum mechanics to mathematically approximate the Raman effect using the perturbation theory. Since the Raman effect involves transitions between induced electric dipole moments, the following equation is used as a starting point. It's more complicated than what we've seen previously, since it is a superposition function of an unperturbed and first-order perturbed wave functions. In addition, given that spectroscopic techniques in general involve time, we would actually have to start with our time-dependent Schrodinger equation and Hamiltonian, and therefore the actual mathematics is quite involved and complicated. Yay, quantum mechanics! Nevertheless, we could use a second-order perturbation theory to give us a mathematical model of the Raman effect, and that's quite cool. Unlike IR, which is arguably useless for quantitative analysis and from experience provides meager qualitative information for chemical compounds, Raman spectroscopy has a myriad of useful and practical applications since it offers for non-destructive microscopic means for chemical analysis and imaging. 
Raman spectroscopy is quite popular for cutting edge research, such as organic chemistry, biochemistry, inorganic chemistry, and geology, and has cool applications such as carbon nanotubing, semiconductors, DNA RNA analysis, and single cell analysis, just to name a few. In addition, Raman spectroscopy is becoming more widely adopted by commercial industries, such as in the pharmaceutical, cosmetics, and food and beverage industries. An experimental example would be that Raman spectroscopy can be used for quantitative analysis of solutions. The relative peak area for each signal in the Raman spectrum can correlate to analyte concentration. An example spectrum shown here is a composite for external calibration of ethanol in water and was used to quantitatively determine alcohol content in various commercial beverages. Unsurprisingly, the end experimental results were within a reasonable range of manufacturer labeling. In fact, the beverage industry in particular has adopted Raman spectroscopy since it's one of the few spectroscopic methods that are not destructive and relatively quick and easy to use. So in conclusion, Raman spectroscopy is a very useful analytical technique. As with all other spectroscopic methods, it doesn't come without its own downfalls, such as incompatibility with fluorescent colors. Nevertheless, its prevalence in both the laboratory and commercial settings continues to grow, giving its high specificity and wide range of suitable applications.